Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for spending another Saturday with us for the second part of our Taste for the Cure and a Taste for Science. We are very excited to share with you some of the work that we're doing at the UCSF Breast Care Program, Breast Cancer Program. And today we're gonna to focus on ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, we're gonna start this, we have a great morning for you. We have our panel discussion about ductal carcinoma in situ. Then we're gonna have a question and answer session where you can ask all the questions related to our talk or if you just have some questions pent up from last week, that's good too. Uh, you're going to hear sort of a, a lightning round of some more of the exciting projects that are going on around the uh, Breast Care Center in our research program that supports our clinical program. We don't have time to tell you about all of them, but this just gives you a taste of science and a taste of the things that we're doing. And after that, we have our cooking demonstration. So very exciting. We're making a baked spaghetti squash. A really easy and fun, delicious uh, and nutritious uh, uh, dish to have for dinner on a busy night. So we're excited to, to, to share that with you. Following that, uh, Dr. Sandy Borowski, who will also be introduced to you on our panel, uh, is going to give us a 10 minute talk about how we're trying to understand the immune system that surrounds uh, these cancers or precancers and what clues they might provide to help us understand how to treat them differently or better. All right. Well, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our panelists. This morning, we are really uh, fortunate to have a great group of people to talk to you about the work that we're doing around ductal carcinoma in situ. So what is ductal carcinoma in situ? It's a collection of cells that by themselves might look like cancer, but there's, they stay within the milk ducts. And this is something that we commonly detect. In fact, today, about a quarter of the so-called cancers that we detect actually are ductal carcinoma in situ. Now this is very different from the era before screening was introduced when maybe only about 3% of these lesions ever came to clinical attention. So I'm gonna start first with Dr. Greenwood. Heather Greenwood is a breast imaging expert. She works at UCSF and she's a fantastic clinician and uh, has been working with us on trying to find better ways to classify and think about how to treat DCIS. And she's gonna tell us a little bit, maybe Heather, you could start uh, for us on, as a radiologist, what do you look for in a mammogram that might give you a clue that DCIS is present? And why is a mammogram better for that than an ultrasound? Oh, sure. Thanks, Laura. And good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here virtually with you all. I'm missing seeing everyone in person this year, but so glad we could be here. So as a radiologist, what we look for on a mammogram to think that something might be DCIS is what's called microcalcifications. And these are tiny white bright dots that show up on a mammogram. Unlike invasive cancer, it's rare that DCIS presents as a mass lesion. Um, and so we're looking at these calcifications on a mammogram and we look for certain shapes and certain distributions that suggest that uh, DCIS may be present. Um, an ultrasound isn't good at picking up these tiny, tiny white bright dots. It's very good for looking for mass lesions um, in the setting of invasive cancer, but it's much less sensitive uh, than mammography to look for uh, lesions that might represent DCIS. So Heather, lots of people though have these little white dots, these microcalcifications, right? So how yeah. do you as a radiologist figure out who to recommend a biopsy for and who not to? And when you do recommend a biopsy, are they, is it always DCIS? You know, that is a great question and something that I think we can really, um, we're working on to do better in because the problem is um, we can't tell a lot of the time. We have kind of in, in radiology and breast imaging strict criteria, we use um, combining information from 
uh, calcification shape and distribution to recommend a biopsy. Uh, but unfortunately, at this point, anything that has been shown to have over 2% a chance of being cancer uh, based on radiology standards is what we recommend biopsy for. So the vast, vast majority of biopsies we do for microcalcifications are benign. So I think that's definitely something that we need to do better um, at is really um, not doing so many biopsies on benign calcifications. And something we'll talk about, I think later in the panel is maybe a better tool and, and what the research we're doing to try to figure out um, how we can kind of reduce some of these false positives. Right. And we'll get to management in just a minute. So next I want to, to introduce Sandy Borowski, who is a breast pathologist at the University of California in Davis. And he is an exceptionally talented pathologist uh, and researcher. And uh, we have been working together, gosh, I've lost track for over 10 years. Well, just, let's just leave it at that. So Sandy, when Dr. Greenwood or any of your radiologists conducts a biopsy and they send you a little piece of tissue, how do you know, or how do you decide if it's DCIS or it's atypian, by the way, what is that? And, uh, or an invasive cancer. And how do you decide that when you look under the microscope? You're on mute. Yes, take myself off mute. Yeah, so what we get is a very small piece from the breast and the radiologist tells us, first of all, whether they were trying to get an area of calcifications or maybe they were trying to get something that was a palpable mass or even something that you couldn't feel or see with calcifications, but they had to find by MRI. And so my first job is to take that little piece of tissue and it, it looks like this on a glass slide. I don't know how well you can see that at home, but, um, and, and look to see, does it look like they got this part of the breast that they were trying to get? And in the case of calcifications, that means I'm looking to see if I see those calcifications on my slide. When I see those, then the next question, you know, sort of in the background is how often is that already DCIS? And that's what you were asking Dr. Greenwood. Um, you know, it's, it's about half the time I get calcifications that are associated with something that I call benign. And about half the time, it's something that's atypia or DCIS. So how do you um, tell the difference between those? Tell, tell, let's tell yes. our listeners what atypia is. Yeah, so what we look for is proliferation within the duct. So we look for cells. And one way to think about cancer is to think about it like evolution, like survival of the fittest. If, if cells in the duct are better at growing than their neighbors, they will take over and they will grow faster and they will expand the duct. So just being able to grow like that doesn't mean that you're DCIS. We call that whole group of things proliferative breast disease or hyperplasias. The feature that I use to distinguish whether it's atypical or whether it's DCIS is, does it look like those cells have lost polarity? They've lost the ability to tell which way should be up, which way should be the middle of the duct and which way should be the edge of the duct. When they lose polarity like that, they grow in patterns that are completely different that I've gotten used to looking at. And those are the patterns that I use to make a diagnosis of DCIS. When those patterns are incomplete, or I'm not really sure that they're all, all the cells have lost polarity, then we have this intermediate position called atypical ductal hyperplasia. But it can be very subjective about whether a very small biopsy uh, taken possibly from a larger lesion um, is something that I would call atypical ductal hyperplasia or ductal carcinoma in situ. Sometimes I even use the term at least atypical ductal hyperplasia, implying that I, I think this might be DCIS, but it doesn't really meet the criteria in the sample that I've got. So it's true. Sometimes people will say at least ductal carcinoma in situ. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we definitely see ductal carcinoma in situ, but we're actually suspicious that it may be invasive. And invasive carcinoma, of course, is uh, much more significant. Um, and I'm sure that many of your listeners know that that's the time where we really start to worry about, do we need to add chemotherapy and make other types of decisions 
rather than just doing surgical excision. Surgical excision with radiation is enough to treat DCIS. So how do I determine whether there's invasion? Well, it can be very tricky because you can get areas of sclerosis or scarring around DCIS that mimic the patterns of invasive. And so when you get a diagnosis that says at least DCIS, what we mean is there's definitely DCIS here in our um, analysis, but we're concerned with the scarring that there may be some invasion. Okay, well, if you're wondering why my eye is watering, in preparation for our cooking demonstration, I was cooking, I was chopping up some red, <laughs> old red peppers for my red pepper flakes. Do not put your fingers in your eye after you've done such a thing. I'm <laughs> recommending that you not do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so Dr. Borowski, Sandy, you said that lumpectomy or surgery and radiation is enough to treat DCIS. Dr. Goodwin, is it enough? Is it too much? Does it work for everyone? Why is a diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ really challenging for both you as a clinician and the person who has been given that diagnosis? Yeah, that's a great question, Laura. You know, when a patient presents with DCIS, the current standard of care is to really treat these lesions very similar to invasive breast cancer in some ways, particularly surgically. And that can include surgery with either lumpectomy or mastectomy even based on the extent of disease and sometimes radiation in particular for patients um, that are having a lumpectomy. And even consideration of endocrine therapy or kind of these hormone blocking pills. And while this might be appropriate for some patients, it is likely over treatment for many women who have DCIS that really maybe their DCIS never would have turned into an invasive cancer given time. And I think that's really where the conversation with patients is can be very difficult about how much do we really need to do? And sometimes when can we consider de-escalation of treatment? So that's a great explanation. And, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that we have done in the, in the setting of bad cancers or bigger cancers is we've given some of the medicines first to see what the response is. That's really helped us change management. What do you think about a window of exposure to some of the risk-reducing medicines we have as a way to sort out maybe even who needs surgery? What do you think about that? Well, I think that's a really innovative thought, and I constantly find patients who struggle with the thought of having to go through all of the same treatments as if they had an invasive cancer. And these conversations with patients are bringing up that people really do want to figure out how much do I really need and how much can I avoid? And I think that if we do have a treatment where we can block the hormone receptor and see how people respond it might help us figure out who can we de-escalate treatment to and who really needs more treatment. Exactly. So Dr. Rosenbluth, you, you, so Jennifer, you, you talked last week about some of the tools you can bring from the laboratory to help understand what cells are really present and how they might best respond. Maybe can you just, in case people weren't here last week, just give maybe a two minute refresher course on that, and then maybe talk a little bit about what we're trying to do with these techniques to better sort out who and how to treat people with DCIS. Yeah, absolutely. So the, tech, the technique that we use is called organoids. And organoids is a term means mini organs. And so what we're trying to do is actually grow small milk ducts and lobules in the lab so that we can study them. So we can grow these normal milk ducts we can grow DCIS, and then we can also grow cancers themselves in the lab. Um, and our goal is to keep um, all of the different cell types, all of the different molecular and biological features that are present in, in those lesions um, alive in the lab, functioning and interacting in their normal way so that we can study those interactions. And so if we have these mini organs or mini DCIS in a dish in the lab, we can ask really important questions. And I think the big one that you, you've just heard is, you know, for DCIS, um, I think a, um, a way of 
of treating that that we need to change is to say, well, some small proportion of these DCIS will progress to invasive cancer, but we don't know how to predict which DCIS will progress, which will not. So let's just treat all DCIS with surgery, all DCIS with radiation, give all patients with ER positive DCIS um, drugs that block estrogen that they would take for five years. And so that that's, feels like a lot of over-treatment. And so um, what I'm hoping is that with the organoids, we can um, study those different cells, study those, those different interactions, and then use that to figure out what DCIS is going to pro uh, progress and then what DCIS is not going to progress. So for example, if um, some of the fat cells are interacting with some of the cells in DCIS within the breast and sending, um, sending signals that are causing that DCIS to act in a more aggressive fashion, then we can actually model that in the lab by culturing those two cell types together and studying all the molecules that they send to each other uh, in, in, that, in that sort of crosstalk. And then there's immune cells that we can culture as well uh, because we have a growing recognition of the importance of the immune system in this regard. Um, and then I think the other important thing that we can do with organoids in the lab is treat them with drugs. So we can treat them with um, these anti-estrogen therapies that we think can prevent DCIS from progressing, as well as potentially even identify new therapies that we think can prevent DCIS from, from progressing or recurring. Well, that's right. And it turns out that we know that all breast cancers are not the same. We talked about that last week. Those are lots of different kinds of breast cancers. And it turns out that's true for DCIS too, correct? You know, the, and these are the precursors. You can have probably, there's probably eight or 10 different kinds of DCIS or patterns of growth, right? Yeah, there's, um, I think that um, there's definitely uh, a lot more work that needs to be done here. And we are starting to see evidence that there's multiple different subtypes of DCIS. Um, I think a lot of what my colleagues here can see clinically um, in terms of radiology features, pathology features are indicating that um, there are different types of DCS, some of which uh, do have a likelihood of progressing to invasive breast cancer, so we'd want to treat in, in a certain way, but some of which perhaps just grow but never invade or never make any changes, and so we'd want to think about perhaps those other types of DCS in a different manner, and so that's another thing we want to capture with organoids and other tools that we're we're using in the lab is we want to try and capture all these different types of DCS and really understand how many different types of DCIS are there. What does that mean clinically? Um, and you know, which ones do we want to treat most aggressively? Which ones do we not want to treat aggressively? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to you, Heather, uh, and say, you know, we've had at UCSF an active surveillance program for a long time over 15 years for people who really, really had done their homework and really just didn't want to have surgery. And we followed them. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the technique we used to image people as a way to take a better look at the whole breast and some of the surprising findings we've had um, just by reviewing. Heather has had been tortured <laughs> to review Hundreds of yeah. MRIs. So, sure. <laughs> so a lot of the patients that we've been following at UCSF, um, actually we are following them with breast MRI and why breast MRI I think is a really exciting tool is unlike mammography, it relies on tumor or DCIS or lesion enhancement. And what that means is that when we inject contrast into a patient's a uh, vascular system, a lesion to grow needs vascularity. And so for it to light up on an MRI, um, it needs to have vascularity as tumors do, and that's how they live. So um, MRI is a really exciting tool that we're really hoping will kind of help us um, as the other speakers were saying, is try to figure out which of these lesions may actually make a difference or in a patient's life or progress to invasive cancer. So we've uh, spent a few years now reviewing lots and lots of MRIs in, in all these patients. And just to highlight a few really um, kind of exciting features um, kind of that are coming out in our pilot study. Um, so on an MRI, not only do we look for a patient's lesion, but we also look at what's called a patient's background parenchymal enhancement. And that's how much of the patient's normal breast tissue also lights up. And we categorize that into minimal, mild, moderate, and marked. Um, and like breast density on a mammography, on a mammogram, um, BPE or breast parenchymal uh, enhancement has also been shown to be a risk factor for the development of breast cancer. 
And so what we've found that's so interesting, um, looking at some of our active surveillance patients is that it's not only the lesion, um, but it's how the lesion and BPE kind of play together. Um, a lot of these patients go on some sort of um, hormone therapy. And so what we've kind of seen is that um, we can early on differentiate if there's a mass lesion, then we might be concerned that that patient actually has an underlying invasive component. But for patients um, on MRI, DCIS often presents as what we call non-mass enhancement. And for patients, sometimes if it's very difficult to differentiate that from just their background or how their normal tissue lights up, a lot of these patients may actually be low risk. Um, and something that's really exciting is that maybe these patients, uh, it's an insight that these patients might not have a high risk of ever progressing to invasive cancer. Um, there's lots of different interplays between um, how a patient's lesion and background parenchymal enhancement responds. So in those patients, who go on a hormone therapy, if the lesion and the background decreases over time with that treatment, um, these patients also might be at low risk of ever progressing to invasive cancer. So I think MRI is such an exciting uh, tool that hopefully we'll be able to use uh, to kind of figure out um, who really is at risk of going on to an invasive cancer and who might not be. So that's so it's just <clears throat> so interesting. It's it's just a surprising finding. And maybe like half the people don't form an actual mass or even this non-mass kind of enhancement. So Sandy, um, maybe that's the better way to decide who has atypia or really DCIS. Maybe the way things organize in the breast from a, you know, you get the one thing about MRI is you get the whole picture. And maybe there's some clue in there about informing your specialty, the pathologists, about what is DCS. What do you think about that? And what should we do about it? Well, I, I think about that in a slightly broader context, right? So what, um, what Dr. Greenwood sees on imaging has to be the result of something going on in the tissue. And so then the question is, what is going on in the tissue? that really raises sort of one of our big central hypotheses. And that is, what is it about the breast tissue that either allows or prevents DCIS from progressing to invasive carcinoma? And, and we really think that that's exactly what's happening is that the breast tissue is constantly surveilling that duct to see if anything's wrong and kind of preventing anything that's wrong from emerging. But when that fails for some reason, that's when you have a problem. That's when you have a DCIS that does progress to an invasive carcinoma. So if we can understand how the imaging signals predict what that breast tissue is doing, um, we can A, maybe see that it's doing a great job and we don't have to worry as much. B, we can see that it's trying to do a good job, but maybe we need to help it. And how can we help it? And maybe we can help it in various ways with hormonal therapy, or maybe we can help it even with, and we'll talk about this at the very end today, immunotherapies of various kinds. And um, so those are the kinds of things that I think about. Um, how, do we, how do we figure out what are those breast tissue things that are healthy, that are good, and how do we encourage them? And how do we predict that they're there from the imaging so we don't have to do a lot of biopsies? And, you know, Sandy, you bring up a good point, you know, that there are some signals that an immunotherapy type approach might be good. Is that going to be good for everybody who has no, DCIS? I, I, yeah, no, I don't think so. Or just a I, subset. I, I, I don't think that it's at all a one size fits all kind of approach. I think we definitely need to be personalized here. I think we can learn a lot from that initial biopsy where I look under the microscope and I say, yeah, that looks like DCIS to me. But I know that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad DCIS or a good DCIS but we have ways now to figure that out and you can monitor that. And some of those ways are in fact, looking at that biopsy and saying, does it look like the immune system is attacking that? Does it yeah. look like the immune system's recognizing that and walling it off and preventing it from doing more damage? And in your talk today, you're gonna to tell us a little bit about some of the exciting 
findings we've had from our vaccine study. So when people have lots of immune cells, we think in these higher risk or hormone negative DCIs, those are the ones we think that the vaccine therapies are for. And we've got a trial for that. So we're still learning. So Karen, you know, if I, so now you're hearing about all these kinds of new ideas. And if it turns out that we can figure out, you know, if, if, if treating the whole breast <clears throat> on both sides is really the right strategy, maybe that's better than surgery for certain types. Whereas if there's a lesion that just doesn't go away and the background gets better, maybe those are the ones, the people that need surgery. Is it time for us to run a trial? If, if we say we're to open up a trial in January <laughs> of, with this kind of approach, would you say, oh, it's too early? Or would you say, oh, thank goodness? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's definitely time to be able to figure out how to individualize patients' care and who actually needs what. And if I could, as the surgeon, say to someone, I really think you need to have surgery to have this removed and this is how we should approach it as opposed to, I think we should just treat this because we're not sure what's gonna happen. I think most patients and most doctors are gonna feel much more confident in treatment options for patients if we can really say, this is truly what you need. You know, a lot of patients go through surgery that probably don't end up needing it. And we just haven't been able to figure out who does and who doesn't. So a trial for this is, is so welcome right now. Now that's great. And you know, Jennifer, I think that this is a, these tools ahead of time to figure out when you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't, I don't want to take endocrine therapy. I don't want to use tamoxifen or I don't want to use an aromatase inhibitor. And they're very upset about it. But, you know, as we talked about last week is, you know, a little bit is understanding your risk is so important. You know, people take statins to reduce their heart disease risk. And that has been unbelievably effective and it's really driven down the risk of dying of stroke or heart disease. In the same way, we can start to figure out who needs which of these medicines. And really exciting is that there's a couple of big studies now that show that lower doses of tamoxifen, which are much better tolerated, like five milligrams, we call it baby TAM, actually can be just as effective as the higher doses. So I think, and there are new medicines on the way, things that we want to test, which I think is really exciting. And, you know, it might be that 50 to 70% of people might never need to go to the OR. But Jennifer, what we've also absolutely. found is that, you know, if the background goes away and the kind of area that lights up, as Heather said, that enhancement stays, you know, those are the ones probably still have a very high risk of eventually developing cancer. And, you know, so we can sort that out in the first six months and figure out who needs surgery, but we don't want to just leave it at that. How are these tools that you have going to help us try and figure out what we can do that's different? Because we don't yeah. want to just keep doing the same old thing if it's not. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a really important question. So first I'll say, I think in terms of, um, I think it's, uh, I think it's a really interesting idea to, use endocrine therapy or anti-estrogen therapy to um, assess someone's risk. And I think we learned about that um, through studies here at UCSF, but actually also during the COVID-19 pandemic, where as medical oncologists, there was a period of time where, you know, we had to think about resources, we didn't have access to the OR, and also patients wanted to, you know, be at home and be safe. And so we actually put, I put all of my patients with ER positive DCIS on um, tamoxifen and these, these endocrine therapies, you know, before thinking about the OR or anything like that. Because, and you know, um, we felt that that was safe and that was a good thing to do and that, that was widely accepted. And we, we, could, um, we could see anecdotally how that could influence, uh, tell us about the DCIS because we could see some DCIS really responding to that endocrine therapy. So I think, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's also treatment for a relatively short period of time, just a matter of months. So I think that um, all these lines of evidence suggest that trying endocrine therapy uh, first, and it's what we call a neoadjuvant approach, does have a lot of power um, in terms of telling us about risk. Uh, and then I think that you know what we want to do is we want to take that information to the lab and then think about what's the next step. So um, we learn about risk, we learn what patients will benefit from these endocrine therapies and what patients might need something else. Um, and then what we do is we look at um, all of the different molecular features for those cases that 
that, um, that, that need the next step beyond endocrine therapy. We look at the immune system um, as was discussed in all these other cell types. And we start to identify molecular features that maybe could be a, the next target. Um, and then what we can do with the organoid cultures is test drugs that inhibit that target. Um, you know, we even potentially have the ability to screen larger numbers of compounds in the organoid cultures to identify the next target, the next thing that we would use. Um, and then we, we, um, that kind of approach can help us not only uh, understand sensitivity and resistance to endocrine therapy, but also potentially identify new targets for preventing DCIS from progressing. Well, and that is, want to tailor that. yeah, that is so exciting because that really is, that's the key for really thinking about prevention, right? That's, that's, you know, cause then the next step is figuring, well, who's at risk for what? And if we fit no kind of in this setting, so DCIS maybe in the future is really our opportunity to change the way we think about prevention. It's not an emergency. Nobody dies of DCIS itself. So you have that window of time to start figuring out, well, what do you need? Who needs what? And if we can start figuring out who's at risk, that really drives us down the path of really thinking about prevention in a very different way. Well, with all of that stimulating discussion, we're gonna open it up to you, our panelists, and Dr. Laura Van Feer, my, uh, my partner in crime here and running the breast oncology program at UCSF has joined us and she's going to take your questions and uh, get the panel to answer them. Laura, okay. what kinds of questions yes, do we there, have? This there morning? are many excellent questions and I answered many people that we will answer them live, not everybody yet, but we will try to <laughs> answer everybody's questions live. Great. So thank you so much for your great questions. I wanna start with a question which was also asked by somebody last week and we didn't get to it precisely. And so it's coming up again. And that question is, um, is there actually two questions on MRI? One is, is there any reason to be concerned about the contrast dye used in, in MRI? And the other question is, will DCIS always light up on an MRI? Great questions. Heather, we're going to start with you on that. All right. So for the, I'll answer the, will DCIS always light up on an MRI? Not always, but MRI is almost a hundred percent sensitive for high grade DCIS. And it's in the upper eighties range for low grade DCIS. So on MRI, occasionally we will not see um, some DCIS, but it's still much, much better than mammography. Uh, mammography is way less sensitive for the detection of DCIS than MRI is. Um, so we have a, you know, I think it's really actually great that the DCIS that we're almost perfectly sensitive for is going to be the higher grades of DCIS. But there are some cases that do not light up. So that's a great question. Another great question and something that has definitely been in the news in the past couple of years is this question related to uh, gadolinium buildup. And there were some early studies um, that showed that, you know, that over time there can be some gadolinium buildup in the brain. Um, since this time, we have switched to a safer type of IV contrast that doesn't break down as much. And I think it's so important to also note that while, you know, some research showed that maybe there were a couple bright spots in the brain from um, gadolinium getting multiple doses, there was never any evidence of any clinical um, relevance of that. So it was a completely incidental finding with um, no actual evidence that it actually clinically affected anyone. But to be on the extreme cautious side, we have um, kind of used a safer compound in the IV contrast that we give for MRI. Um, and especially for our patients, um, you know, with a high risk for breast cancer that we screen every year with breast MRI, like such as a BRCA mutation. Um, I think we all counsel our patients that the risk of developing a breast cancer is so much higher than a potential theoretical risk of um, getting repeated contrast doses. So I hope that answered your questions. Well, I, I think actually we can address another question that I'm sure people are asking, well, why don't we just use MRI all the time? That's I think one of the surprising things too is when you get an MRI, not only will the DCIS light up, but a lot of times yeah. everything lights up. Yeah. So the reason, you know, there's a few reasons that we don't recommend MRI for, especially for screening purposes in the average risk patient. And that's because there are, like Dr. Esserman was referring to, 
a lot of false positives. MRI is by far and away going to be the most sensitive exam for the detection of breast cancer, but it's not very specific, meaning we see a lot of things that are benign, but that we don't know are benign and patients end up with MR guided biopsies, which are very expensive and cost is another reason we don't recommend MRI on everyone. It's an extremely expensive exam. What's really exciting, I think right now in the radiology community is this idea of abbreviated or fast MRI, um, which is something that there's a lot of research on now where basically it's a shorter MRI. Um, we don't have it yet at UCSF, but I really hope soon um, that costs a lot less. Um, so that's something that I think our community is working on. But again, there's too many false positives and it's a very expensive exam. And that's why right now um, it's not recommended for an average risk patient for screening. But it's a great tool for yeah. evaluating. We use it for eye supply. We use it for our invasive cancers. And now we're going to use it routinely on our DCIS patients to help us learn and change management. Okay, Laura, next question. Yep, you're on mute. A question, because you're talking a lot about the risk to develop invasive cancer and high risk and low risk, um, but somebody asked actually a really good question. Um, how often does DCIS progress uh, to invasive cancer? And a related question uh, to that is, uh, can you please talk about approaches to high grade versus low grade DCIS? But first, I think what is what is the chance that somebody will something will become invasive? Well, so you know, I think it's important to put this in perspective with the large trials. You know, if you have a mastectomy, your chance of developing a recurrence in that breast is extremely low, one to two percent, right? But you know, if you have a lumpectomy, even with radiation, you still have somewhere around a ten percent chance of getting a cancer. What we found in our active surveillance group is we can identify a low risk group that doesn't have surgery or radiation that has somewhere in that range of 10%. Um, and we hope we'll be able to make that better. You know, we'll hope we'll be able to figure out how to optimize that and make it even lower. But there is, and part of that problem is that people have risk of getting a cancer. You know, some of this may be that it's a risk factor. Dr. Goodwin, I think that's Pretty, what else, what else? I mean, it's, it's like, it's like a risk factor, right? In a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, I think thinking back many, many years, we used to think similarly about lobular carcinoma in situ being a cancer. And we used to treat it aggressively like a cancer and is now considered more of a risk factor for development of breast cancer. And I think, you know, we may be on the path of saying the same about some DCIS and, and that's really the goal of these active surveillance trials. And Laura, you asked about high grade DCIS, right? Yes. And or high. So it, what's what's very confusing, and we we actually we're all working on this big grant really to to address this. We spent the last few days. Everybody can help with on this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the, this is the big question: How do you define high risk? Actually, high grade is not that useful. And Dr. we're going to have Sandy tell us why the pathology term of high grade isn't that useful. But there are some cases that we know, if you're hormone negative, you know, if you are, uh, if, if it's large and if it forms a mass, these are lesions where we know that you're more likely, you know, much more likely to get a cancer. Although we're trying to sort out with this trial we have, I mean, I think we can identify the groups that are pretty low and then the groups that are pretty high you know, might have a 50 or 60% chance of, of ever developing a cancer. I think, you know, 10% versus 50 or 60, that, that actually gives you a pretty clear choice. What we'd really like to do with these kind of a more aggressive, instead of, we won't call them high grade for the, and as, and maybe Laura, you can talk about this a little bit since you are, you know, one of the leading people in the world on breast cancer classification. But, you know, that, if we see these more aggressive hormone negative, so not driven by hormone therapy tumors, we're trying to think about using immunotherapy to see if we can get the body to finish the job and make them go away. Uh, Sandy, do you wanna say a little bit more about why is grade, you know, about 50% of cases are called high grade. Does that necessarily mean they're aggressive? I, I well, 
I want to start with the first question because you know I love this question. <laughs> what is what is the what is how often do DCIS areas progress to invasive carcinoma? It's a very difficult question to answer because we treat those DCIS lesions. And so only in the active surveillance cohort, which is only in the women that we think um, have the lower risk, the 10% risk, do we get to some of those answers? There's some really interesting studies where um, they have looked at women over long periods of time who had a diagnosis of DCIS, but a low grade of DCIS that wasn't treated beyond having a biopsy. And the answer in those patients is it's about 50%, but it can take 40 years to emerge. So that long, long time span really kind of hits on what you're saying, Laura, is that maybe we just think about the fact that you have one DCIS that we see under the microscope as evidence that you're kind of at risk to get another one or even to get an invasive cancer. So that's part one. Part two is even if you get an invasive cancer after the diagnosis of DCIS sometime later, for some reason, your prognosis is still much better than the average person with invasive cancer. We, we see women with DCIS, if you take them all together with treatment, right, yeah. you do exceptionally well, like 99% cure. And that's not true for invasive, of course. Um, so these kind of things make us really question how aggressive we should be with our treatment of DCIS. I will say this, the big difference between high-grade DCIS and low-grade DCIS is the high-grade DCIS is much more likely to be an accurate diagnosis. There's much less subjectivity in evaluating those slides when it's high-grade. We can recognize it easier. When you start talking about small biopsies of low-grade DCIS and asking, is that really DCIS or would another pathologist maybe could just call that atypical ductal hyperplasia? A really interesting study from our colleagues in Vermont says it's kind of like flipping a coin and ADH and low-grade DCIS maybe really are the same thing. And maybe what they are is evidence that that person has an elevated risk, but they are not themselves these precancers that are destined to become invasive. Um, I think that's a, I think that is a great point. And I think that, you know, we, people, I, I noticed that, you know, when you're talking to people, they'll really fix on a particular word like high grade, or they'll think, okay, that's bad. And low grade is good. And that's not necessarily. Even the term carcinoma in sight too, you know, I, right. I've had um, friends and family come to me and say, I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I, you know, the first thing I want to do is, hey, can you get the pathology report? I can tell you a lot more if I can read the pathology report. And if I read the pathology report and it's ductal carcinoma in situ, I realize the word carcinoma is in there. And that means breast cancer, right? But if it's still in situ, I tell them at best or at worst, that's a pre-cancer. It's not yet cancer. And I think at best, um, many of these things are just risk markers and not yeah. cancers at all. And, and so, it, so the, the terminology is really confusing. I can't tell you how many women I've talked to who say, I have, uh, you know, I, I'm a breast cancer survivor and it's because they had DCIS. And I, you know, I kind of bite my tongue. I want to say, well, yes, that's great. We treated your DCIS, but I don't think of that as breast cancer. You know, I, I think that's, you know, and I think there's another really important point and maybe Laura, I, I can ask you from your vantage point, I mean, you are sort of one of the pioneers in developing different ways to classify tumor where, you know, our standard tools have been grade as dictated by the pathologist or hormone receptors and HER2 receptors. But maybe you can talk a little bit about the classifiers that you've developed in the past and the ones that we're actually just putting out now. And it's probably pretty likely that all of these precursors, these DCIS are, some are destined for these same pathways. And maybe you could just 
explain to everyone listening a little bit about what are these different ways of classifying tumors and why is it likely to be better and more informative? I think that's a nice follow-up of what Sandy just explained about if, if the carcinoma is in situ. I mean, we have some, a few an, or a number of ways how to describe what the pathologist she, sees through the microscope, uh, whether there are, uh, how many dividing cells there are. So that defines the grade. If they're above a certain threshold dividing cells, it's called high grade. If it's below a certain threshold, it's low grade. Um, and then, and then pathologist looks whether the estrogen receptor is present or not. That will define if hormonal therapy might be helpful. And and what I'm doing, I'm a molecular biologist. I sort of what I describe always look under the hood. And I've done more work in invasive breast cancer than in DCIS, but it's it's the same theme. So if you look at the outside of the of the cancer cells, which is what you do under the microscope. <clears throat> you may classify it in one way, but if you look under the hood, you can really define if the biology um, of a certain type is really active. So we were looking at uh, signaling pathways of estrogen receptor or signaling pathways um, of DNA repair inhibitor drugs or signaling pathways of immune modulation. And so for DCIS, we also start to see that it's actually very useful. And so this is in a research phase um, to understand what is the immune, what are the immune components of the DCIS? And do we see immune cells that, that we could use to actually recommend from the biological point of view? I'm not a physician, but a biologist, um, that immune modulation is a good therapy. So, so we, we have actually, we're reclassifying or proposing to reclassify invasive cancer into response prediction classes so that we can match therapy A to response prediction type A. And so we're, we're starting to do this in DCIS as well, in particular in the immune modulation. And there's actually also a question um, in, in the chat about how to, um, when to use immune modulation and is this a good way uh, to help patients? So I think well, we, I think I, I, I as you know, question. as you know, Laura, I think that we should be using what we've learned and all that we put, you know, put forward to help us figure out how to manage people with DCIS. I bet we could use those immune those those molecular classifiers to figure out who needs the vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so there's the, two other yeah. questions on organoids. So, so one question is if you take a piece of somebody's DCIS and make that into an organoid, are you making one organoid or are you making multiple organoids out of that one tissue? Um, and yeah, that's actually the first question. Yeah, that's a great question. So <clears throat> we can work with even very small pieces of tissues. And um, so it actually each tissue is made into what we call one culture, which is a collection of these little mini organoids. And then the mini organoids will grow and, and continue. Um, so um, each piece of tissue is used to make one culture and that culture contains multiple organoids within it all from the same piece of tissue. Another question is, is actually about sensitivity to treatments. So. Well, maybe, sorry, my other question for the, the organoids was, can organoids at one point also be used to study atypia in the breast? I know that's a great question. That's also something that we're interested in because um, you know, as Sandy, Sandy and many others discussed, we think a lot of these molecular features and these pathways have shared aspects and then different aspects. And we wanna try and understand that. So we wanna understand DCIS, but also other um, types of lesions and other, um, other the biological underpinnings of other types of breast cancer risk. So we want to understand risk as a phenomenon. So yeah, we're absolutely interested in, in that as well. So on the treatment, there, there are several questions actually. And so one of the questions is um, if DCIS shows not to be hormone sensitive, meaning the estrogen receptor is not present, what are the alternative treatments 
And another question is, if you're 10 years out of a DCIS diagnosis, should you still continue uh, to take endocrine treatment? I mean, that all depends on somebody's specific diagnosis, but in general, I think, so what, what, what is possible for a, an, an endocrine insensitive tumor? And, and if it's endocrine sensitive, how long should you continue the treatment? Um, I think surgery is probably, you know, the, the right treatment for a hormone insensitive tumor. But again, that's what these active surveillance treatments are for. You're going to hear a little bit more from Dr. Borowski about, or Sandy, about the, about the vaccine trial we have. So if you have a hormone negative, we actually have a vaccine trial. This is for people going to the OR. We're trying to figure out how to develop better treatments. And actually, if you stay tuned for all of our lightning talks, you'll hear more about the different options. Um, and I, I think a lot of people ask, you know, if I have DCIS and I've been on it, am I a candidate for baby tamoxifen? And I think, I don't care, I, I would say that that's, it's a very reasonable choice, I think, with the data that's out there, don't you? Yeah, I think baby tamoxifen is, is really interesting and we need some more studies on it, but I think the study looking at high-risk women showing a, a significant decrease in development of breast cancer with baby tamoxifen for three years, as opposed to full dose tamoxifen for five years is really innovative and, and helpful that maybe we can actually start using this for things like DCIS. Right. And, you know, someone else I noticed said, you know, how do you, you know, how long should you take it? We, we don't think that you should take these hormone drugs forever. Uh, maybe Jennifer will <laughs> sort that out, but uh, you know, that we generally think that five years is all you should take it for. And as Karen said, we don't know, maybe three years is enough. We just don't know. And those are things we have to work out. But, you know, I think a lot of people say, well, you have to think about someone's mental health or how people think about it. You know, remember, these are very safe drugs. They've been used in thousands and thousands of women. So, you know, rather than reading the side effects or hearing how someone else responded to a medicine, it's always good to say, is there gonna be some great harm to me if I try this? And if not, why don't I understand how it works for me? You can't decide whether or not it's gonna affect you by reading the label or talking to someone else and learning from their experience. You actually have to understand it for yourself. And if you're doing well, great. If you're not doing well, you can you know, talk to your clinician about adjustment. Um, but I think, um, you know, Jennifer and, and Karen and I are routinely involved in these conversations. I think a lot of people don't realize that they can just learn themselves about how they respond. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pill. And so you can, you know, there's a definitely different adjustments you can make. And also I think people should realize it's a pill. And so if, there, if you were one of those rare patients who did have side effects, it's something you could stop taking. Yeah. I have one other interesting question with for somebody who has dense breast tissue. So somebody with dense breast tissue who had a lumpectomy for DCIS, what, what should that be the best follow-up after that? Uh, I, and, and maybe I'll, 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 I'll let Heather talk about it. This is the, the, the decision about who should get an MRI versus who should get a mammogram. These are really complicated topics and I would not say that there's great agreement. But Heather, where, where from, the, from the radiology standpoint, who are the people who are the more likely to benefit? And remember, one of the reasons we don't want to just give it to everyone is there are a lot of false positives, which can be very torturesome. Yes. Sure. So I agree with different, um, from the radiologist standpoint, um, the American College of Radiology in 2018 updated um, who we think benefits the most from screening breast MRI. And kind of one major update um, before that, women who had a personal history of breast cancer, um, who either have dense breasts and or were diagnosed premenopausally, we, our uh, college recommends screening breast MRI in those patients. And as Dr. Esterman says, there's a lot of personalization that can go into that decision and things vary, but um, it is definitely something to consider. And again, that's because 
we know that mammography is, is much less sensitive in women who have dense breasts because cancers and breast tissue are both going to be white on a mammogram. And luckily, breast MRI is not affected by dense breast tissue. We're still very sensitive, um, even if in a woman who has dense breasts. And one of the things that, you know, I think there was a question about who should, you know, you know, when should we decide who gets an MRI? Well, that in fact is what the wisdom study is also all about. Are women informed to screen depending on measures of risk? What we want to know is, you know, who's got the risk factors, including dense breast tissue, and who's got genetic risk. Right now, if you are inherit a mutation in one of these genes, we talked about this last week, you know, we alternate screening with an MRI and a mammogram. So you're getting something every six months. And Heather explained to us earlier that actually there's complementary information. So that's why we alternate them and we look every six months. I noticed there's a question in the chat too about why, you know, if a cancer is there, a fast cancer came up, you know, was it, and I have dense breast tissue, was it missed on a mammogram? Well, not necessarily. Remember that was one of the things we talked about last week. If you have a fast growing cancer, you know, that really may never be detectable six months earlier. This is why we're trying to sort out who's at higher risk so we can screen people more frequently and with the tools that we think are gonna be more effective. And Sandy and Jennifer and I were also talking about how do you find people really who have the kinds of cancers that are gonna be super aggressive and maybe that depends on your tissue. And so it's certain kinds of tissue and maybe it's not just breast density, but something, right Heather, maybe density that's X, Y, or that has certain features, right? So that we can do better. There's so much more information that's in these imaging tools. And if we can sort out who's got that kind of risk, again, if it's everybody or it's 40% of the population, that would be a disaster, right? But if we can get down to the five or 10% of people who are at highest risk, we can really start to do better things. Right, Sandy? That's your you know, those, you know, so I, I and, and, and I think it's important that we get away from this idea that we blame women or we blame the physician if someone has a bad cancer, those bad cancers grow very quickly. That's just bad luck. You know, it's not that somebody missed it or that you missed it, that these cancers can arise very quickly. And those are usually, you know, the, the scarier kinds of cancers, but that's, that's really what we are trying to um, uh, the, the, that's, that's a, that's the flip side of DCIS, right? What are the ones that the cat's out of the bag, even a diagnosis. So like, how do you find those? And Sandy, again, it might, we're, that's maybe that's, we can end on that framework to say, it might not just be the tumor itself, right? right. Sandy. So we, we definitely, we definitely think that some of these cancers are kind of born born to invade, born to metastasize, born bad, if you will. And um, they might not have a DCIS stage at all because as soon as they're initiated, they become invasive. Now, what is it that makes them that way? We, we've sort of failed to be able to catalog them effectively by just looking at the cancer cells. And so I really think it's a question of what is the potential that the cancer cell is born with? But more importantly, what is the opportunity that the host surrounding offers to that cancer cell that's born with that potential? So it's both the potential and the opportunity. And if you, you know, just extend the metaphor, you can imagine that you have a cancer cell that's a weakling and not very good, but it's provided an outstanding opportunity to get out into the world. And so it's successful. And for a cancer to be successful, of course, that's bad for the person. Um, so I, I think of, I guess I'm anthropomorphized in cancer, right? Um, but your cancer success is the is causing mortality. Um, we, we don't want cancers to be successful. So if we can learn to prevent them to, from having that opportunity, if we can create treatments that reduce cancer cell opportunity, I think there's a, a really exciting future for reducing the mortality of these very aggressive cancers that we're not picking up in screening because they occur between mammogram um, appointments and arise very rapidly. Um, we, um, it's really where we wanna make the most impact. 
And it's such a I great. Have a good last question for you, Laura, because okay. I think we're getting short in time. But yes, many people ask. So, if I want to participate in a clinical trial, like maybe contribute in donating organoids or a screening trial or a, a vaccine trial, how how do I how can I find that out? So that is a great question. And when Ananya talks about the website, we'll talk a little bit more about that today. But. Uh, we, you know, for DCIS, if you're newly diagnosed with DCIS, we have a number of trials. We have a vaccine trial for people with um, with hormone negative or these sort of larger palp, you know, tumors or masses that you can feel. We have we have there are 30 trials that are ongoing at the breast care center, and we'll have them listed on our website. But always, 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 if you have a diagnosis, ask your clinician, is there a trial that I can participate in? Remember, that's how all of our advances uh, have been made because people have participated not only in getting care, but in a clinical trial that advances our way of learning. As Karen said earlier, that's why a trial would be so welcome. We don't want to keep doing the same thing because it's hard. You're not going to get a different result. Or as Sandy said earlier, if we just keep operating on everybody with DCIS, we're never going to change the field, especially when we think now, as Heather said, that there may be half of people that, you know, don't don't need that approach or could take a different kind of approach. Or as Jennifer said, then we can start chipping away at the ones that we don't understand and come up with new therapies, which is just, I think, so exciting. And it might be, and as you heard, I think this is like sort of the, this is, you know, those of us who've been practicing for 30 years, you know, what we don't want to do is be doing the same thing tomorrow that we're doing today. Uh, so look on, there's breastcancertrials.org. You can look for ongoing trials, even as survivors. You can look on our website. So Ananya will make sure that we have lots of ways on our website to learn about different trials. If you know someone who's just diagnosed with DCIS, every single person with DCIS diagnosis can be in one. We have a trial for everybody. We have a registry for everybody. We have a vaccine trial for people. We now are going to the OR. We are studying the people who come in with, and you don't become an invasive cancer. That must be a clue. That's the other side of the seed and soil idea that Sandy talked about. Um, so we're very excited about this whole new idea, this whole new approach. Um, you know, I think there are uh, at least 20 to 25 treatment trials uh, at all levels of, of care and many on imaging. So we'll have them on our website. You can look at breastcancertrials.org uh, at any time. There's lots of survivorship trials as well. Uh, again, together as a community, uh, we want to keep making sure that tomorrow's treatments are better than they are today. So with that, we're going to conclude our panel. I want to thank our fantastic panelists. Virtual round of applause. I'm sorry that we couldn't be here in person, but we're going to move on to our uh, lightning round. Thank you so much for all your questions and for staying with us and uh, and all of your interest. We have, don't don't leave yet. We've got lots more excitement for the day. This next hour is going to be jam packed with fun things. We have our lightning talk from our post baccalaureate interns who are awesome, as you will see, you're gonna get seven snippets of great information in three minutes. We're very excited to start that. Then as our cooking demonstration, spaghetti squash is on the menu with Chef Ali Mountford, and who's gonna take me through the, the, the steps to make this in my kitchen. Uh, and then we're gonna finish up with uh, Sandy Borowski, who you just heard from talking a little bit about you know, what we can learn about the immune system uh, in, in, uh, un, by looking under the microscope. Very exciting. All right, without further ado, uh, Rashna, can you uh, um, put up the, the slides? And we'll get started on our lightning talks. And by the way, the slides will be posted and the, this has been recorded, so everyone will be able to record it. Okay, so we have seven great short talks for you. And the first talk, you've heard a little bit about the wisdom study, but you're going to hear a little bit more about it. And uh, the first up is Paige Warner, who's going to talk about rethinking screening for breast cancer. Paige. 
Hello, everyone. Yes, like Dr. Esserman introduced, I'll be answering what the last decade has taught us about screening to start today's very today's series of very insightful intern talks, as I'm sure you all will agree. Right, next slide, please. So first, it's important to know why we screen in the first place, and that is screening can detect cancer before symptoms appear and also catch the cancer early uh, while it's still localized to the breast or, in other words, hasn't migrated and is therefore very treatable. Uh, but however, cancer or breast screening, it's ultimately a balancing act and more does not always mean better. For instance, while more screening has led to more detection over the past 10 years, there has been less decrease in regional disease than we had hoped. And more screening can also lead to more false positives that can in turn direct you to more costly and time consuming tests that you don't want to have. Um, and finally, if we can detect more cancers, we can consequently overdiagnose many minimal risk or indolent breast cancers. Next slide, please. And that being said, if you had fun with us at last week's Taste for the Cure session, you know that there are many types of breast cancers that grow at different, uh, with tumors that grow at different rates and with different risks of harm as you'll see in this cartoon. So in red, the bottom horizontal axis represents the time in years and the top arrows are the times when you might have a screening done. And the four curves from bottom to top are showing the different rates of tumor growth and the chance that the cancer will either remain as a microscopic tumor, will stay in the breast locally, will spread to the lymph nodes regionally, or will spread to other organs in the body. And if you're on the bottom, you're on a path where the cancer will probably not cause death, whereas women with tumors in groups B and C will probably benefit the most from screening. And the tumors in group D are the ones that are growing too fast for our current methods of screening. Next slide. And all this is to say that despite all the strides we're making with screening, 40,000 plus women are still dying of breast cancer every year. And we're trying to find ways to, find, to make that better uh, by tailoring screening to your own personal risk. So first, let's say that you're low risk and you're someone who would be on that bottom slow growing cancer curve that we just saw. In your case, you may need less screening and treatment intervention, and that's good. On the other hand, if you're high risk and more likely to be on that fast growing cancer curve D, then you would take a different approach where you would learn about ways to lower your risk through education and prevention. But the tricky part is that clinical trials like the wisdom study are trying to find out how to identify who is low risk and who is high risk with the development of personalized screening tools. Next slide, please. And essentially the wisdom study is the infrastructure with which we are trying to work uh, to find which approach is better. Either, a standard, either the standardized national guidelines of annual mammograms or a personalized screening schedule based on individual risk. Uh, the idea of which is reflected in what WISDOM itself stands for, women informed to screen depending on measures of risk. And we don't know which approach is better, but that's exactly what we're trying to find. And you can help us find, figure this out and join the study if you are a female between the years of 40 and 74. Uh, with no personal history of breast cancer or DCIS. And you'll also hear more about the wisdom study in the following two talks by Catherine and Rashna. And you can also learn more by visiting that link in the slide right, right there. Well, thanks so much, Paige. <clears throat> and the people in the audience says, what can you do to participate in a trial? Well, even if you've had cancer, I'm sure you know lots of women between 40 and 74. Tell them all to join the wisdom study. So that is a great way to advance the field for us. So next up, we have Catherine Leggett Barr, who's going to talk about more about personalizing breast cancer screening. And uh, Catherine. Well, thank you, Dr. Esserman. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Catherine. Um, so following my colleague Paige's discussion about why we need to rethink our screening approaches, I will be discussing how we might personalize screening given one's individual risk factors. Next slide, please. So first of all, it is well known that everyone has a differential risk for developing breast cancer. Risk originates from a variety of different facets of one's identity, including one's age, one's race, one's genetics, one's breast density, and one's family history, among other factors. We also know that not all breast cancers are created equal. Some are slow growing and others are fast growing. Some are hormone positive and some are hormone negative and all can have considerably different prognoses. We also know that risk can often predispose one to a certain cancer subtype. So for example, while non-Hispanic white women have the highest incidence of breast cancer overall, 
non-Hispanic Black women have considerably higher incidences of some of the most aggressive cancer types. Similarly, while the overall incidence of breast cancer in younger women is lower than in older women, younger women who do develop breast cancer tend to have faster growing tumors. Next slide, please. So given that everyone's risk is different, is there a way to personalize screening that considers each person's unique risk factors? Is it possible that one singular screening approach really doesn't fit all? Screening is currently the best way we have to detect cancers at early stages, demonstrating why it is so important to learn and to optimize what the best screening schedule is, whether that be a personalized screening approach or even something else. Next slide, please. So to understand how a personalized screening approach might work, let's meet Jane and Olivia. Jane is a 45-year-old woman who has extensive family history of breast cancer, is a BRCA1 mutation carrier, and has very dense breasts. In other words, Jane is considered at higher risk for developing breast cancer. In comparison, Olivia is 70 years old, is mutation negative, has fatty breasts, and does not have any family history of breast cancer. Olivia would be considered at lower risk. Should Jane and Olivia be screened the same amount? In a personalized screening approach, Jane would be screened more frequently and comprehensively, and Olivia could likely be screened less frequently. Next slide, please. So how can we answer this question of what is the optimal screening approach? The WISDOM study is actively enrolling women nationwide to see whether and how we can tailor screening based off one's risk factors. This method will hopefully help us better detect high risk lesions at early stages, while also hopefully reducing over detection of lower risk ones. You can learn more about the wisdom study by visiting the links below. And thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, Roshna is going to talk to us a little bit on a slightly different topic of things that we've learned in the wisdom study about how changes in imaging actually have some impact on the cost effectiveness of screening. Rashna. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about how changes in imaging and a risk-based approach impact the cost effectiveness of breast cancer screenings. Next slide. So we know that breast cancer screenings are incredibly important for early breast cancer detection, but like Dr. Greenwood alluded to in the opening panel, they are quite expensive and come at a price for both the patients and the healthcare system. The Affordable Care Act improved access to screening mammograms, but it's been estimated that up to 10% of women who do get a screening mammogram get called back for additional testing. And this can be quite nerve wracking, quite unexpected, and quite expensive, especially for patients who don't have health insurance. E from Chicago, Illinois said that she still paid $1,700 because a no-cost mammogram led to an ultrasound, another mammogram, and an MRI. Likewise, when we look at aggregate costs for the system, it's estimated that up to $8 billion were spent on breast cancer screenings alone in 2010. Now, all of these numbers are definitely not to say don't screen, but we want to screen when it makes a difference and when it benefits us. So, how can we make sure that our dollars work for us? Next slide. Well, as we just heard from Catherine, breast cancer risk is highly variable and dependent on many different risk factors, such as the one shown here. In a personalized risk-based screening approach, women screen depending on whether or not they would benefit from those screenings. So if you're at high risk and you benefit from screenings, you screen more frequently. However, many women may not benefit from additional screenings and may be able to safely screen less. Next slide. Thus, in this risk-based personalized approach to screening, we have the flexibility to use our resources more wisely. Savings from low-risk patients who may not benefit from those additional screenings can thus be directed towards and allocated towards our high-risk patients. This personalized approach may lead to fewer recalls, biopsies, and false calls false positives, all while still maintaining the ability to detect cancers when curable. Overall, still producing high value, high quality care, but just through a better use of our resources. And this risk-based personalized approach is different than what we are currently doing, 
it's new and it needs to be tested so that it, we know it's safe and effective and that we can improve upon it. Next slide. And this is exactly what we're testing as you've heard in the previous talks in the wisdom study. To learn more and enroll in our study, you can visit the links below. And if you also like to take a moment to watch and learn about what our participants are saying, you can read about us in Time Magazine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashna. And actually one of the, one of the things that we've been working on is for people we identify at high risk, we actually help to make sure that they get their um, more intensive screening covered by insurance. So it's, it's, it's all a process and this is how we learn to move the field forward. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna get back to the subject of this morning's talk. Uh, and you're gonna get to hear a little bit more about what we learned in our active surveillance study. So Christian Maldonado Rodas is gonna be our next speaker, Christian. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Esterman for that introduction. And today I'll be talking about DCIS and the role that imaging can play in determining the best treatment, surgery or active surveillance. Next, please. So first I want to talk about ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. On the right side, you can see an image of the breast and the breast is composed of many different glands such as the lobules and ducts. The lobules create milk and the ducts carry that milk to the nipple. So ductal carcinoma in situ is the growth of abnormal cells within those ducts. You can see an example of this on the bottom right within that red box. So currently treatment for this involves surgery, endocrine therapy, and radiation. However, it's really important to note that not all DCIS will progress invasive cancer. So that means that some of these options may actually be over treatment. Next, please. So how can we help patients choose the best treatment for them? One, one way is by using MRI features that can help predict risk. There are many MRI features, but today I, I'll only be talking about two. First, let's talk about background parenchymal enhancement, or BPE. You can think of BPE as the increase of white or bright enhancement within normal breast tissue after contrast is administered. You can see four different examples of BPE below. A is minimal BPE, B is mild BPE, C is moderate BPE, and D is marked BPE. And so like I said, you can think of BPE as that increase in white enhancement within the breast tissue. The second MRI feature is lesion distinctness. And you can think of lesion distinctness as how clearly you can see a lesion from BPE. An example of this is below. So within that red square, you can see a lesion that is clearly separate from the surrounding normal tissue. Next, please. Now let's talk about the different treatment options, surgery or active surveillance. Active surveillance is a treatment plan that closely monitors a patient's DCIS with MRI scans over time to detect any changes. You can see a quick little flow diagram for active surveillance below. First, the patient is diagnosed with DCIS and they choose to go on active surveillance. Then at, at zero months, they get their first MRI, the provider evaluates this MRI and the patient continues on active surveillance for three more months. At three months, the patient gets their second MRI and the provider reevaluates their MRI for any changes. Based on their changes, uh, the provider may recommend that the patient continues on active surveillance, meaning that their DCIS may actually be lower risk, or that the patient continues to surgery, meaning that their DCIS might actually be higher risk. Our main goal here is to use imaging features that help predict risk and offer our, our patients the best treatment available. Next, please. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thanks so much, Christian. So Christian showed the details of how we're running that active surveillance study that we talked about uh, this morning. And uh, that's a way that we uh, can use time and a short period of exposure to a medicine that we might recommend for five years and first find out if it's working. Uh, so uh, that's, I think, a really exciting way to advance the field. So thanks so much for that really crystal clear explanation, um, Christian. Uh, so next we're going to talk about and, and actually answer the questions that someone in the panel said, well, what about 
the higher risk or the high grade DCS, what do we do about those? And here to talk about that is Nikki Schindler. So Nikki. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nikki and I'm very excited to share with you um, a little bit about one of the trials we have where we are trying to harness the immune system in treating women who have high risk DCIS and improve outcomes. So next slide. So you just heard from Christian a little bit about our active surveillance protocol and what we're doing for women who have low risk DCIS. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about women who have DCIS that's considered to be high risk of becoming invasive cancer for different reasons. And we're trying to understand why it is that some women develop invasive cancer from DCIS while some don't. And what we have is a new trial where we're looking at women who have these particular high risk features, things like having a palpable mass, hormone receptor, being hormone receptor negative, HER2 positive. And what we're doing is we're treating them with immunotherapy and surgery and hopefully improving outcomes over time. So next slide, please. So one of the amazing things about cancer is that it has the ability to kind of put the brakes on your immune system so that your immune system can't fight it off. So what we're doing is we're using an immunotherapy cocktail, um, a drug called Keytruda, which has been used in treating early stage breast cancers in combination with a new drug made by Moderna. And we're using this cocktail to try and bolster the immune system and increase the number of T cells and different immune cells around the DCIS. And the hope is that these immune cells will go in and fight the DCIS, kill it off on its own, help the body resolve what's going on there. And so what you can see on the left here is what we call pre-treatment immune desert. And if you look at the bottom image there, you can see some actual tumor cells from a patient who this is before receiving the treatment you can see the empty black space around the yellow cells and then on the right side you can see all of those purple and green t cells around the tumor and so this is what we're this is what we're after with this with this new trial next slide and so the way that the trial works is you'll be screened and enrolled and then you'll receive two injections over the course of six weeks. These are low dose local injections, which means we are injecting straight into your DCIS. And then afterwards, you'll receive surgical resection, either a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. And the hope is that we can alter the immune system even after surgery and kind of create a protective effect so that we are preventing recurrences of DCIS and invasive cancers over time. So if you're interested in joining the study or think you might be eligible, please contact me. I am the study coordinator and my information is right there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Nikki, for that great explanation of a complex talk, topic. Um, and if you know anyone who's got a, what we consider a more or a higher risk DCIS, let them know about this trial. That's actually uh, the most important thing is to test some new approaches if we want to move this field forward. Eventually, we know we're going to get there. We just need to keep working on it. Okay, we're going to take uh, our next intern, Alex Patello, uh, is going to talk to us about COVID. Alex, tell us a little bit about how it is you got, you're in our breast cancer internship program, but you're talking to us about COVID. So hello, everyone. I'm Alex, and I'm here to talk about tracking the rates of critically ill patients in the ice by COVID trial based on vaccinations and seeing the critical role of vaccinations and also discussing the next steps for the trial. By the end of this presentation, I hope you all see that vaccinations help reduce the risk of COVID-19. But why am I talking about COVID in this breast cancer taste of the cure? Well, let me tell you, because when the COVID crisis hit, Dr. Esserman helped her colleagues in the pulmonary critical care field to create an ice by trial to rapidly screen promising new drugs for people that are critically ill with COVID. So let me dive in into my presentation. Next. So for this slide on the left, we have an animated number of cumulative COVID cases over time at the beginning of the pandemic to current times. Let me click next to show the animation. 
The lighter the color represents the low COVID cases, while the darker the color represents the very high COVID cases. I'll let that play in the background while we talk about the figure on the right. So to the right, we have COVID cases, reported cases that show the peaks and the dips at specific, specific timelines. At the start of the pandemic, we had a surge, uh, we had little to no cases, but that changed. We had a surge in the winter, as shown, and vaccines, vaccines came in, the number of COVID cases dropped drastically. And it looked like everything was transitioning to normalcy. It was when the Delta variant was detected in March 2021 in the United States that the transition to normalcy was reversed. Next slide. Now for the enrollment for the I Spy COVID trial, I superimposed the enrollment with the COVID case to show that when we have high COVID rate, we also have high enrollment in this trial. When the vaccines came out in December 11, 2020, we saw a decrease in the COVID case and also a decrease in enrollment as shown in the figure. Then with the Delta surge, it was mainly driven by the unvaccinated folks. And it's the same trend we see in the COVID-19 trial. You may also wonder, hey Alex, what's the demographic majority of the population of the I spy COVID trial? Well, let me tell you. The majority are males at 58%. The majority are 60 years and older and the majority are white a Caucasian at 49%. To emphasize again, people in the hospitals that are critically ill with COVID are dominated almost exclusively by people who are not vaccinated. Next slide. In this trial, we collected vaccination status from March 2021 and to current and found out that one in eight people are vaccinated in the trial. This is low, but is representative of what we see in the population. Again, unvaccinated folks are driving the searches and being vaccinated helps prevent people, um, preventing people from getting critically ill from COVID and it protects people around you. If you are still deciding to get vaccinated, this is the sign to get vaccinated. Next, please. For our next steps, if we learn from our previous strides in cancer, before we believed all cancers were the same, but they're not the same. Each cancer has a different genetic makeup and drug effectiveness is dependent on individual risk. Once individual risk may work excellent on drug A, but not for drug B. Taking one individual risk is working phenomenally well in the iSpy trial regarding breast cancer. For our next steps, we believe taking one individual risk for critical ill patient nice by COVID trial is our next push to tackle this crisis. In closing, the best protection from COVID is being vaccinated. Avoid the suffering from getting critically ill. Just get vaccinated. And if you require assistance, making an appointment to get a vaccine or require more information, feel free to reach out. And lastly, for our next steps to this trial, is to make the trial more adaptive by taking one's individual risk. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Alex. And it's so interesting how the lessons from one field can influence the other. And this next, as you heard on the panel this morning, we're not only thinking about how to subtype the disease, but we're also thinking about how to subtype the host and trying to understand what those risk factors are and that's the same approach that we are trying to take and that our my critical care colleagues are trying to take in the ice by covid trial so it's good to see that these general lessons and the platform for accelerating learning is is moving across the field of medicine okay with that we're going to go back to our <clears throat> breast cancer uh, trials and we're going to hear next from Annie Patterson who's going to talk about the microbiome what in the world does the microbiome have to do with breast reconstruction? Annie, can you tell us more about that? Great, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Esterman. I'll be um, speaking on the microbiome and implant-based re breast reconstruction, and if this is a potential way to improve infection risk. Next slide, please. To start off, I'll be giving a brief overview of breast reconstruction. 
In the United States, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime, and approximately 50% of women diagnosed with breast cancer will undergo some form of breast reconstruction following mastectomy. There's two ways to do this. One is to use your own tummy tissue, known as autologous reconstruction, which is shown on the right here, or you can use an implant shown on the left. The most common form of reconstruction by far is the use of an implant at over 70%. This is nice because it doesn't require you to use another body part, but the dreaded complication from implant-based reconstruction is infection. While this can be treated, sometimes it can lead to having to take the implant out, and this is problematic because it can delay cancer therapy, delay reconstruction, or even lead to a failure of reconstruction. Next slide, please. To narrow in on the infection rate after implant-based reconstruction, I would first like to speak on some of the risk factors associated with this complication. Risk factors include smoking, radiation, and obesity, among others. You might think, why not use antibiotics to prevent infection? While the use of antibiotics just prior to surgery and 24 hours after surgery have been shown to be beneficial, the prolonged use of antibiotics after surgery is not supported by research evidence. Routine antibiotic use after surgery means that if you do end up with an infection, that it can grow in the face of antibiotics, which would potentially make them resistant and more difficult to treat. Like the theme of many prior interim presentations, more isn't always better. This leads us to the interest in studying the potential of the human microbiome, which is the community of microorganisms that live within and on our bodies to evaluate whether this can help us with this problem. Next slide, please. We've learned a lot about the microbiome recently. We know that the breast tissue has its own microbiome, that women with breast cancer have significantly different microbiomes than individuals without breast cancer, and research has also shown that the microbiome can affect infection rates in other parts of the body. Moving forward, research on this subject conducted here at the Breast Care Center includes first, considering how antibiotics affect the microbiome, and studying how antibiotics can affect the underlying colonies of bacteria that might make you even more susceptible to infection. Along with changing the way we are using antibiotics, we're hoping to study how harnessing some of the good bacteria in the microbiome to protect against infections, which could be done through diet and lifestyle changes, um, or even using probiotics. Through this research, we hope to learn more ways to protect individuals from implant-based breast reconstruction infections. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and a little book recommendation if you're interested on this topic. It is a great book. I strongly recommend it. It's just so interesting. It'll change the way you think about bacteria forever. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Annie. Uh, and we're going to finish up now with Ananya Middal, who's going to talk about our new BCC website. Hello everyone, I'm Ananya and today during the panel we saw some questions about how you can get the information you need about specific disease types, about treatment courses and about clinical trials. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can get that information when you need it. In this digital age, we have access to so much information at our fingertips between Google, WebMD, social media, it's hard to determine what's true. And often even trusted sources are confusing with so much information that may not be relevant to your particular case. As my colleagues have talked about both this week and last week, breast cancer is not one disease and there's so much personalization and there's so much difference between what type of treatment might be relevant to you depending on your disease. Next slide, please. Dealing with a cancer diagnosis is hard enough without having to navigate through a sea of seemingly conflicting facts. And it's very easy to get lost in all the information. Next slide. Here at UCSF, our goal is to personalize your experience with information. We're working on restructuring our website so that we can compile relevant and up-to-date information in one place so that it mirrors your journey in the clinic with the information that you get from your doctors matching what you find online. And we're working to present this information to you in different ways, making it easy to access, understand, and share. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of innovative changes that we're in the process of implementing. 
we're working on putting together digital materials that can be leveraged by your clinical team in the form of QR codes that can be handed to you with links to relevant videos, information that you can get in the clinic and then access from home whenever you want, as many times as you want, um, and also share with your loved ones who you'd like to be in the loop about your care. We're working on putting together flash talks by providers where they talk about their specific areas of interest and areas of expertise, giving you a window into the science and into the services that we offer at UCSF. And then finally, we're working on putting together a resource hub, bringing together both informational materials, instructions for your pre and post surgery, pre and post procedure facts, um, also relevant information about clinical trials and services so that you can access all of this from one place. As many of you have experienced, sometimes our patients at UCSF have a little extra time when you come into the clinic. And we want these visits to the BCC to be an opportunity for learning for you. So we want this information to be at your fingertips accessible to you as you're sitting in our waiting rooms, waiting to see, with, see our doctors. Um, next slide, please. We're excited to bring these innovations to you and change the way that we use technology to add a layer of experience within our clinic. Next slide, please. In the meantime, while we're working on getting this up, please share with us your experiences, your grievances, and your feedback so that we can keep your concerns at the forefront of our process. My email is listed here, and I would love to hear from you about your thoughts. Thank you. Well, Ananya, thank you so much for that. We are really excited about our new website. We think it's going to be really great for, for all of us. And uh, we so appreciate all the hard work of all the clinicians and, and researchers and, and Ananya and Sarah Golden and, and uh, Nikki Schindler, who've been working so hard on this. I want to thank all of our interns. Uh, we run a post-baccalaureate internship program for, um, uh, we've been doing this for uh, almost 20 years. And this year we have 15 fantastic uh, people who are spending a year or two before they go off to graduate school or medical school. And they are the heart and soul of our research program. And we are so grateful. They're the ones that do the patient consultations that you heard about from uh, last um last week and uh, from Eliza. And uh, we are so grateful to all of you and you guys did a fantastic job. So great job. All right, so our next, uh, our next uh, event for you is our cooking class. And we are so happy to have Chef Allison Mountford back. And while she introduces herself and talks about our next uh, our next meal that we're going to cook together, I'm going to walk over to the kitchen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. So nice to see you, Laura. Um, we've been doing this. I tried to count. I think this is our 12th or 13th um, Taste for the Cure cooking demo. It's one of my favorite. Years. Um, what's up? Can I hear you? Oh. Um, so I um, met Laura in the kitchen years and years ago and have been cooking privately for families. I had a cafe and a meal delivery company for a long time. Um, and I now have a website that helps people reduce their household food waste. It's a way to cook a little bit more sustainably, save money, and hopefully also makes it just easier to get dinner on the table after a long, busy weeknight. So today we're gonna be making stuffed spaghetti squash. So this one, usually we do a recipe for this that really comes together in 15 minutes, but I wanted to do this even though it takes a little longer in the oven. So we have some prepared that you can see what it looks like after about 45 minutes in the oven. But it seems like this year more than ever, I've been getting so many questions about cooking with winter squash and people are intimidated about cutting it open and not knowing what to do with it. So I'm excited to show this recipe and all of the ways that you can adapt this to fit your taste preferences, to fit your diet. Um, and um, it's just a really fun, easy way to use spaghetti squash. You could also do this with acorn squash. Spaghetti squash is really fun just because of the way that it looks afterwards. And it was actually in Laura's kitchen so many years ago that I first ate spaghetti squash. And do you remember this way? You used to love to do it in a, um, in a casserole dish. So right. we'd actually cut it open, scrape out the strings so that it looked like spaghetti and then bake it almost like a lasagna in a casserole dish. And it is really, really good that way. 
this will give us the same or very similar taste and consistency, but you get the added just fun factor of serving it in the squash. So it like looks like a little boat. Um, and also it's, you don't have to dirty up your dish that way. So one of the, one of the things that I, I, I have to say, Ali, the, the, the trick of putting it in the microwave, which is sorry for the background noise, I'm heating mine up, is an awesome trick. It's the hardest part of spaghetti squash, you know, yeah. is getting the right knife as you know, as a surgeon, having the right tools is always the most important. But having to cut that uh, when it's whole is hard. But when you get it out of the microwave, it's so easy. I This is the first time that I've made it this way. I love it. How long did you put it in for? Two minutes? No, I, you, said, you said six. So I put it in there. Okay. So I did, I've tested this a few more times. I did have one that sort of burst a little bit, but what happened was it just kind of burst on the side of the skin. It was still fine. So I've sort of um, increased it, but basically what we're gonna show you at home is Laura has hers in the microwave whole. So you basically just take it like this. You'll wanna wash it a little bit, especially if it has any dirt on it, um, but you can kind of just stab it with a fork, just get a little vent hole and you can see my fork is not really going through here. We're just puncturing it enough so that some of the steam can escape. The first time I tested this, I had read it online and I was really nervous about putting a whole squash in the microwave and walking away from it. I kept like standing in my kitchen like this. I thought it was gonna explode and come flying out or something, but it doesn't. Um, and you could do, I've also tested it as low as two or two and a half minutes just on full power. I literally just hit, you know, add 30 seconds and it softens it up to make it a little bit easier to do the first cut. However, I didn't stick my fork in it. Either time. We'll, we'll see what happens if it comes flying out. No, it will not. I, I, I'm not trying to um, bring my fear to you all of things exploding out of the microwave, um, but I did find it works out great if you just kind of stick a few vent holes in it and just do it for a few minutes in the microwave, somewhere between two and six, depending on how soft you want it to be. The other added benefit of doing it that way is that when we go to put it in the oven, you actually have a leg up on cooking. So when we're doing it just from cold and getting it in the oven, it will take almost 10 minutes longer to cook all the way through. But um, let me show you how to do this otherwise. So, you know, the, the most dangerous part is this first cut because this is so wobbly. So you want to really kind of Get a firm grip on it, but far away from where your fingers are. And you're just gonna take off this little tiny bit of stem. So one of the first things about cooking with food waste is we don't wanna over trim off the ends. So I really just am gonna take a little slice. Once I get my knife in there, so it's not wobbling around, I'm really gonna use the um, quality of my knife, the sharpness of the blade, not a big sawing motion because that's where you know things are rocking and you'll get fingers underneath. And you can really just use a little bit of power to cut through it. And then what we have is a stable surface, okay? So we're gonna do this on the other side. I'm also gonna take off the stem here. And you can see it's, it is a little, um, you know, I'm rocking around a little bit. It's definitely a little nerve wracking, but see where my fingers are really far away. My thumb on the other side is far away. I'm not getting up close because you don't wanna get your finger in there. But the other trick that I've found is that once you get your knife kind of wedged in there like that, you can use a little bit of gravity to help you out. So I'm gonna palm this side and pick the whole thing up and then drop it down and it flies off. So I'm using the weight of gravity to, and, and sort of the thud to help my knife get through it. Now that I have a sturdy side, it's gonna be a lot safer and easier to cut through the middle of the squash. So I'm gonna do the same thing and just be really careful to like work it in. Now, once I have it in there, see, I can lift this. It's so wedged, but I can't really get it down without. So on this one, I'm gonna put my, hold my knife like this and just give, this is maybe an inch under here and just use the kind of um, banging and the force of gravity to go through it. And it's a lot safer than any sort of sawing or wild, like, you know, pressure that you're putting on it. All right. So let's see how you do yours now that it's out of the microwave. Allie? Yeah. Did you see? So this was, it was so much easier for me to get those edges off. Yeah. Now look at this. I can just kind of go right through. It's not quite like butter, but close. The only yeah. problem is it's a little hot. 
It's a little hot, yeah. But definitely easy oh. to do and well worth a few minutes in the microwave. Um, if you don't have a microwave, the other thing you could do is set up a pot on the stovetop with a steamer insert and get about an inch or two of boiling water and then put it over the steamer insert with the lid on it. It will take a little bit longer, but you could still put the whole thing in there and it'll be much easier to cut. Now, the other thing so now we have this part, we're gonna take the seeds out. And I have to say, Ali, when I cooked it for the six minutes, it was gummy to get the seed. It was harder to get the seeds out because they all kind of, so the two minutes each side, I did two minutes and I, Turned it. So that's perfect. Maybe two minutes is, yeah, it's, you know, it's always, we're always improving. It's always a work in progress. It is very easy to get them out when it's really cold because you can hold it and when you can scoop it out. So, you know, it's always a little trade off. It depends on, on, you know, which part you want to, to work a little harder on, but I like the two minutes on each side. So I use an ice cream scoop. I just have a metal. It doesn't have the, um, the release button, but I find that anything this shape, so a tablespoon works as well, but you can kind of just scoop in nice, beautiful circles, and then it really gets the seeds and the, um, and the strings, the pulp kind of out from the middle, it's just like a pumpkin or butternut squash. And also just like the other hard winter squashes, you can cook and eat these seeds as well. Um, this was another one that I've tested a few times. You know, I, I see everybody always talk about eating, cooking and eating pumpkin seeds. I never really thought that they tasted good, um, which, you know, I want to help people reduce food waste, but I don't want you to eat things that feel like garbage or things that should be waste. So I separate out my seeds here. And what I have found makes them taste delicious is to actually blanch them first. So I would separate all the seeds just like, and you could do this when you're carving your pumpkins, if you're doing that this week um, or using butternut squash, all of these winter squash seeds are edible and they're really similar in taste. So I take them when they're slimy straight out of the squash, blanch them in a pot of boiling water just for like three or four minutes. And it really gets the bitterness out of them and it gives them more of a, like a cooked feeling when you eat them later. Um, so then once you drain them, dry them off, drizzle them with a little olive oil and then whatever sort of spices you wanna put on them. So things like a chili powder blend would be great. You could use something like Old Bay. You could use any sort of like barbecue rub. You could do just garlic powder. You know, the, the oh, you know what would be great that everybody loves is that everything but the bagel seasoning from Trader Joe's, you could put that on them. And then just roast them on a sheet pan at about 350 toss them around a few times and roast them until they're golden brown and crisp. Um, you know, somewhere between about 15 and 20 minutes, let them cool down. And I find they taste delicious that way, but it's all about that first um, blanching process. For about a minute, Allie? Three, she said. Three minutes? Three minutes, yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. So we're gonna stuff these because that's our recipe today. But if you wanted to make the type of spaghetti squash where you scrape this out, like I used to make for Laura and put it in the, um, the baking dish, or even if you just wanna serve this, I've come to really love it, like really simply, almost like pasta, just with butter and Parmesan and salt on it. One of the easiest ways to cook this now is to microwave it again, but this time set them face down in a little casserole dish with enough water to just kind of come up the side, maybe about an inch and microwave it for about 12 to 15 minutes and it will get soft all the way through. The other option you obviously have is to put this on a baking sheet. I drizzle it with oil and salt and roast it, but it takes about 45 minutes. So if you're looking for something quick and weeknight ready, you could really do this over the weekend, you know, wrap these up airtight. And then on the night you need to eat dinner quickly, go ahead and microwave it and then season it however you want. You could put marinara sauce on it, however you want to serve it that night. And it's really ready in about 15 minutes. So it's barely longer than it takes to boil a pot of water and make pasta. And it's just a great way. Like, why would you do that? I love pasta. Pasta is delicious. But it's just a great way to try something different, switch it up a little bit. And it's also really good for you, just like carrots or any other yellow or orange vegetable. It's filled with those vitamins. It's got a lot of fiber in it. And it's just nice to, I don't know, have a different taste, right? It tastes good too, so. Okay, so we're gonna make our filling. Um, for the filling, this is a great recipe because it's such a good, um, like clean out your fridge recipe. You can really adapt this 
to your preferences, your food tastes. Um, you could add some ground turkey or chicken if you wanted to sa saute that up first, or you can make the vegetarian version that we're doing here. Um, I also tested one, I'll show you at the end to make it vegan. So if you're not eating any animal products or you wanted to cut down on cheese, um, it's really still super tasty that way. And you can still follow the same procedure. So I have a little bit of frozen spinach. I use this a lot because it tastes delicious and it's really easy to keep in your, in your freezer and it doesn't go bad as quickly as fresh spinach. I have a little bit of uh, mozzarella cheese. And then I didn't have this in the recipe, but I opened a jar of these today and thought it would be delicious. Um, I have artichoke hearts. So we're gonna, gonna go with the spinach artichoke vibe. But also, as I have in the recipe, I have a red bell pepper. I like the red bell pepper here because um, it adds color and it also gives you like a really different texture in there. It's just different than the way the spinach or the uh, spaghetti squash tastes. So I'm going to do my slices of pepper here and I'm not going to cook these ahead of time. So we're going to slice them just into thin strip. So this would be like a julienne. Did you chop your pepper, Laura? I'm doing it right now. I I did my shallot. Now, I was gonna see if you want to do your um your pepper chopping okay. technique. Good. You know, just I you know I I that's one of the things too is that you know sometimes if you're I think you know if you put it with a with a slick side down it's actually easier to to slice because it, then you're not having as you're using the force of your knife to get through that thicker skin. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna mix up into my, um, actually, let me just, whoop, into my bowl for the filling here. Um, so into here, I'm gonna do my spinach. So I would, you can't see this because you can't see my sink, but I would take clean hands and after your spinach has defrosted, which you can do on the countertop, as long as it's less than four hours, and you could also do in the refrigerator. Um, and you could let it defrost in the refrigerator for three or four days and it'll be fine. But then you want to really squeeze the water out of it. So I just do this in a colander or right over the sink. You can kind of see how much water is coming out of there. And that's just water that it retained while it froze. Um, and you really want to get that water out of there because it's going to add, you know, watery texture, but it's not a great flavor. So we don't want that water. We'll replace that water with a more flavorful liquid, um, after. Okay. So that's pretty easy. We're going to do that. Um, you could, I'm, I'm going to just add my bell pepper in here. Basically everything's going to go, this is going to go so long in the oven that we don't need to cook anything ahead of time. If you wanted to use fresh spinach, obviously I would saute that ahead of time because you do want it to be this wilted consistency. Wow, there is like a ton of water here. Yeah. You, you really want to squeeze it all out. I'm going to dice up my artichoke. So I got just a can of artichoke quarters. I, I have to say I didn't wait for the the my earlier one that I cooked to, to defrost. I did not get anywhere near this amount of water out. <laughs> it's a lot. And <laughs> it'll cook in the oven for so long, some of it will evaporate, but I'm gonna show you how we're gonna add either some cream or if you're going dairy free or even just lighter on dairy, we're gonna add some stock to it. So it's still water, but the stock just brings more flavor to it rather than just the spinach. Um, so over here, I'm going to add also some salt. And I like black pepper. If you don't like black pepper, um, if the spice doesn't work for you, you can omit that. And I'm going to do dried thyme. Um, I use dried spices a lot, especially if, you know, we're, we're not cooking that much. If you don't cook very often and we're talking about food waste, you can almost always substitute a dried spice and then you don't have to worry about them going bad. Um, fresh herbs are one of the things that people tell me the most consistently goes to waste in their house. So just keeping that in mind, or you could grow it and then just pluck a little out of the back, you know? I forgot yeah. I'm putting some time in there. That's good. All right. Yeah, it's nice. I would do even, um, rosemary would be good in here, especially, you know, kind of fall dish. So you can see the beautiful colors. And then I'm going to add, um, about half of my mozzarella. Um, in the original recipe, the, um, there's goat cheese, which is super delicious. I didn't have any open today, but I had this um, provolone. So I'm going to just grate a little bit of that in there instead. If you're going dairy free, just omit the cheese. That's it. And then I'm going to switch over 
<laughs> Are you using goat cheese over there, Lauren? I'm using goat cheese and I'm putting in these artichoke hearts now. What a great idea. Um, okay, so then we're gonna poke, I'm gonna poke a few holes in here. And the reason we're poking the holes in the shell at this point is to help the flavor get in there and season the squash. So I'm gonna just do a whole bunch like this. Okay. And then I'm right? What's that? Not through the outside, right? Not through the outside. Nope. I want the shell to stay intact so that it holds all the liquid in there. But the the squash at this point um, is really pretty bland. It doesn't have much flavor. So it's able to absorb a lot of flavor and it's easier for the um, the salt to kind of permeate through the squash if we poke those little holes just to help it along. And I'm gonna sprinkle the bottom of the crust with a little bit of salt at that point. And then I'm gonna just do this right on my baking sheet. You could put a little, you could do it in a casserole dish if that's better for you. Um, you could line the sheet with foil if you wanted to, but I found you don't really even need to do that. And then I'm going to stuff. And you have to put oil on it, Ellen? I put a little bit in there, yeah. You probably could get away without it. If you were watching how much oil you were using, you could definitely get away um, without doing it. It's, you're not really sauteing it. It just adds a little bit of, of moisture to it. But if that's a concern for you, you can definitely omit that part. And we're gonna stuff this fully. Use it all up, right? Yep, use it all up, stuff it in. And if your sides are uneven a little bit like mine are here, um, that's okay. So you can kind of see how this one is filled, you can't see over the top. And this one, I just mounded the extra filling. So I still tried to even it out a little bit. And I then- I saw this, somebody, but you're just taking all your stuff and you're just mixing it all together until it sort of turns into a mush, right? Yep, mix it up until it's a similar consistency all the way through. And then for the sauce later, we're gonna use roasted garlic. It's a really nice way to eat garlic because it's so tender. So we'll just put those there on the baking sheet and you can just peel them into cloves and you can just put them like this on the baking sheet or you can actually take the clove of garlic and lop off the top, which is I think how Laura did it over there. And then you can roast the whole head of garlic. So I would make that decision based on how much roasted garlic you'll go through. If you just want one or two cloves, just a little bit, you can just put them on the baking sheet like this. But if you like a whole head of roasted garlic, you can serve it you know, on pasta, you can serve it on any other grains, you can stir it into marinades and salad dressings, it really makes the garlic a little more mild. And it, for some people, it's easier to digest as well. Oh, and it gives it a really nice sweet flavor. What's that? You're gonna put the pepper flakes. Oh yeah, red pepper flakes. Um, again, I, I like the kick of the red pepper flakes, but if that's not um, something you're into, you can omit that. So now let's say I had one of these that wasn't going to have dairy in it um, and one of them that is. The one that has dairy in it, I'm gonna put about a tablespoon of half and half heavy cream or whole milk. Don't go any lower than that in fat content, otherwise it'll just split and be really watery. Um, and I just poured that right into the shell. If you're not doing any dairy at all, get a little bit of chicken stock. Um, I just buy it. I make it when I can and have it in the freezer, but sometimes I just buy it as well. And we're going to do a little bit less. So I would do maybe a teaspoon or two of stock. The cream reduces and so will any of the milks. It will reduce and actually get thicker, but the stock won't quite reduce as much. So that's why we want to do a little bit less. Okay, wait. So, you, so I, so the one I made earlier, I just I put the milk in or the the cream in the in the mix. But this one, I'm just gonna pour it on top. Either way, yeah. I think I wrote it the first time I mixed it into it, but then another time I just poured it over the top. It's basically the same. If you're doing it with all of the dairy and you're using something like goat cheese or cream cheese, and you need to loosen it up in order to make a consistent filling you could add it to the bowl. Otherwise, with mine, I didn't have any goat cheese in this one, so I just poured the cream over top. So I'm just pouring, so I'm just pouring it over the top. Yep. And then I'm gonna cover each one with foil, and I'm really gonna crimp it down. And what this is doing is, this will retain some of the heat and the steam, so it'll make like a little mini convection oven inside each squash, and this will help it cook 
quickly. Otherwise it could take a really long time and it will help retain the moisture. And then this way the cheese won't over brown as well. And we put this in the oven at, I forget what I wrote down to be honest. It could go anywhere between 375 and 425. It's not gonna make a big difference in temperature for a dish like this. Um, so I would say maybe 400 and you roast this for about 30 minutes that way. It depends a little bit whether or not you microwaved your squash ahead of time. If you have, and it's already a little bit soft, it might, you might go closer to the 25 minutes. And if your squash is still cold and fully hard like this, you might need a full 30 or so. And then what you're looking for um, is it'll be hot, but you can kind of take a towel and you can squeeze. And if it feels like it has a lot of give to it, then after you know 25, 30 minutes, then you'll take the foil off. And then you have your leftover cheese. If you want to put cheese on the top, I like to do another sort of cap of cheese and then put it back in the oven for a final 10 to 15 minutes so that it gets beautifully browned on the top. And at that point, um, perhaps you take your paring knife or your knife and you should be able to stick it in the side. You wanna test right on the rim over here. This is the part that we're worried about and just test and see if it goes in really smoothly. And then you can also just test on the bottom. You should be able to squeeze it. And that's how you'll know that it's really tender. And I will show you what mine look like. I'm gonna show you what mine looks like. We have to show, actually, Ali, we have to do the, the garlic thing. Yeah, so I have the garlic here. So when the garlic comes out, here's my roasted garlic. I'll show you that. Okay, so let me my, here's mine here. Okay, I've got my garlic. Yours, I honestly, yours look better than mine. They, yours look like the cover of a magazine. They look amazing. And it's that cheesy top that you really got on yours there. What do we get? So what I'm doing here, I'm just squishing this into, do I need to do bowl first? But yeah, okay, we can show the garlic first. So you can squish your head of garlic. Show them how you have your um, head of garlic. So Laura just topped off, chopped off the top of the whole clove of garlic, which is an awesome way to do it. And again, if you like roasted garlic, you might as well roast the whole thing. I just did a couple of individual cloves here. So mine, I'll just peel out of the paper at this point. And Laura, you can just start squeezing yours and they'll, they'll all come out. They're coming out of both sides, all right. Yeah. You can um, squeeze them out the best that you can, but then you can also put it down on your cutting board and use your knife, sort of like a flat edge um, to you know squeeze it out like you would a tube of toothpaste almost. You can kind of start on one edge and go all the way. So when you roast the garlic low and slow like this, you end up with just a really, really soft caramelized garlic. It's more, it's sweeter, it's more mild in flavor. It doesn't have that intense peppery bite of raw garlic. So a lot of people who dislike raw garlic will still really enjoy roasted garlic. So you can kind of see the color of the clove there. It's nice and soft. And then you can mash this up. You can chop it with a knife if need be. You can also just mash it with the back of a fork. And if you're dairy free or you know eating fewer animal um, fats, you can just use the garlic like that. You could even stir in a little Dijon or a little bit of lemon juice, maybe even a little bit of vinegar. And it's sort of on the line of a, a warm vinaigrette. If you don't mind a little bit of butter, it's really good to mix in, mash in with a fork, some room temperature butter. And then you use either one of those situations on top of your final squash. So it makes like a nice sauce. So if you had fresh parsley or basil or something that you wanted to add to it, you could also chop that up and stir it in with the garlic and the butter and it'll make like a beautiful melted garlic butter that further seasons your, your squash. So mine here, I did this one without spinach. So you can see this one has the cheese and I'll show you how the edges here are just really tender and you can kind of, when you serve it, I like to look for little ones. You can see how small my squash is. Laura's looked a little bit bigger, so you could still serve the whole thing. I think it would be a lot for people, but you can also just cut it in half like this and still just serve this whole boat on their plate. And then this is the one I did that didn't have any cheese in it. And you can see there's less, you know, there's less body and the vegetables all wilted. But once you kind of get in here and twist this up, you can fluff it up first if you want. 
it's still really beautiful and super delicious. So if you don't do dairy, you can definitely mix that up. Um, and once you get it all fluffy, you can see the beautiful strings of spaghetti squash. If you wanted to try to do a vegan cheese, um, if you like that texture, there's some amazing vegan ricottas. So I would look for something like that, something that's kind of soft and creamy rather than any of the melty ones, unless you have a, a melty vegan cheese that you feel like works really well. Sometimes I feel like the consistency doesn't melt quite as well as I would hope. So I'm just cutting this in half. All right. No, we cut it in half. I, it looks really long. I think that would be a lot to serve for an individual person. The other way you could serve it if you didn't want to cut it in half is you could just actually go back in. So if I have my scoop here, you could actually just go in and serve it scooped in a bowl. You could serve it over a piece of um, like a big crusty piece of grilled bread or something. And I would serve this to make it a full meal. I would just serve this with a really super simple side salad. But what I really like about doing it this way is that, you know, you saw us do the prep and we were even talking through it. It's a really quick meal to prepare. And then most of the time it just hangs out in the oven. So as long as you're home, um, it's, it's a pretty easy dish, but I think it yields an impressive looking result afterwards. And it's very tasty. Oh it's delicious. Good, right? So good. Oh my God, it's so good. And it was so easy. Super easy. And you can make it, you could add, imagine adding like sauteed mushrooms in there, or um, you could even stir in a little bit of pesto would be really good. You can kind of get wild with whatever. This is like a great add to it. What's in the fridge? Whatever you've got left over, you can just mix in here, right? This exactly. What's in the fridge? Stuff squash. And yeah. the other cool thing too is, you know, the spaghetti squash, if you see them at the store, um, how long did you say you had yours? Like two months and it was still fine, right? Oh, I think yeah. I got like six months. Yeah. The right. hard winter squash, as long as you store it away from humidity and in an area where it's relatively cool. So like, don't put it in your cabinet next to your stove because that one tends to fluctuate in temperature. But if you can store it, you know, in a cool, dry place like a pantry, um, the hard winter squash should really last for a long time. So you can always have this ready to go. And it's, even though it's a fresh vegetable, it can also be a, like a pantry staple. And, you know, I just got one of the seeds that was from the, one of the original seeds and it was delicious too. There you go. Yeah. yeah so don't worry about taking every seed out. Actually, I kind of like that. If you did also take the seeds out and do the roasting process and then bring them back and top the squash with that, that would be an awesome idea. We could do I that. Like that. I love it. I well, like fast, delicious, healthy, taste for the cure. Perfect. So, Allie Mountford, as always, fantastic job. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Sure. And I love this. This is so delicious. This is now going to be a new staple for me. All right. All right. Now I'm going to cook my next one while we hear from Sandy Brasky. So big hand of applause for Allie Mumford. I got to get all this garlic off my hands while Sandy's telling us a little bit about. Uh, we want to welcome Sandy Borowski back to the screen and hear a little bit more about what we can learn about the immune system and all the cool tricks they have in pathology and the immunologists have developed to really understand the immune microenvironment. So, Sandy, welcome back. I don't know how I follow you guys cooking. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have me starving to death now over here. Well, you should have been making it as you went, and then you could eat it. I should be driving over to your house for some of that squash. Yeah, you can finish the ground. I have plenty left over. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I know we've kept you all here a long time, and thanks for staying with us. Um, I just want to give you a little um, insight into some of the things that we work really hard on, and maybe part of the reason why we're working really hard on some of this research. And so I can figure zoom out and share my screen with you all. Oh, I started with the complicated slide just to scare you. All right. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're thinking about helping your immune system fight cancer. 
And this has been a, sort of a, a, a revolution in cancer care over the last five, 10 years that um, we're really just at the very beginnings of. So it's a very exciting time to be learning more about how to harness your immune system for cancer care. Um, let's see. Yeah. So personalizing the way that we treat cancer is pretty new. And it started with this idea and the National Cancer Institute really had a, a a lot of sponsorship of this, where um, we ought to look at the new technologies to identify um, features in individual cancers that would mean that we should prescribe very specific drugs. And so a simple way of looking at this is already complicated is to look at the genome or the, the, the sequence of genes in the cancer. And this thought process was a good one, which is if we find a gene mutation or a gene change in your cancer, and we have a drug that we know is specific for that, uh, that may be more important uh, and a better way to treat that cancer for you compared to somebody who has a different mutation in their cancer they may benefit from a drug that's specific to that different mutation. And so that's kind of depicted in this, in this cartoon format where different genes lead to different drugs for different groups of patients. Um, this was kind of a simple way of thinking about it. Um, and um, these guys, um, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, sort of helped us put it in a bigger picture context. And they thought, um, maybe if we draw a subway map, people are used to looking at subway maps. And even though subway maps are complicated, if we put the genes in a subway map and show which ones are on the same line, which ones are on the red line and which ones are on the blue line, um, that might be an easier way of thinking about the complexity of this, um, you know, certain genes and certain pathways causing cancer. And you heard us talk this morning about, um, especially Laura Vantbeer talking about how we're more and more trying to classify breast cancers based on the predicted response to specific therapy choices. In any event, um, part of what I'm gonna tell you today is that as soon as we think we have something figured out, we realize that it's a little more complicated. And so this subway maps of the hallmarks of cancer that came out in about 1999, um, although it was revolutionary, we quickly learned that this was too simple of a way of thinking about it because cancer doesn't occur just within a cell and then create a clone of those cells. Cancer exists in a more complex environment. And we're learning more and more about the environment. So these same guys, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, um, maybe 10, 12 years later, they, they admitted that they had to add uh, the complexity of the situation to their hallmarks of cancer. And what you can see here are some that we're really interested in. So some of them are the same ones, genome instabilities and mutations. Those are the genome instabilities and mutations that happen here. But a couple are, are new here, tumor promoting inflammation and also tumor um, suppressing immune, uh, tumor suppressing uh, inflammation or immune system. Um, and so one of the things that the cancer has to do is evade the immune system. Um, in here are other things too about blood vessels and, um, activation uh, of pathways that lead to metastasis. All of this got more complicated than anybody really wanted. But in 2006, a really interesting um, paper came out on colon cancer in science where Jerome Gallon and his colleagues from France looked at colon cancer. And instead of just looking the normal way and asking who survives based on our staging system, they asked who survives their colon cancer based on whether they have infiltrating T cells 
and infiltrating macrophages in and around those cancers. And what they found is that this was an even better way of identifying patients who had a lot of T cells and macrophages infiltrating their colon cancer, that that proved that those patients did really well. So there was something about seeing the immune system and the T cells and the macrophages attacking that tumor that meant that even though it looked like colon cancer, and even though it looked similar to, might have high stage, might be stage three growing through the wall of the colon or stage four with metastasis, that these patients that were stage three but had a lot of immune infiltration did very, very well. So when we think about the immune system and um, how it interacts with cancer, we have to start looking at the components of the immune system. And while the immune system um, can be thought of as kind of a simple system where, um, you know, just like with COVID, if you have a vaccination, what you're doing is you're teaching the immune system what to recognize. So it's a learning system. Um, it turns out that that learning system involves a lot of interaction between different cell types. And so um, some of these cell types you guys may know about, you may know about T cells and the different types of T cells. CD4 T cells are the ones that are the targets of HIV, for example. Um, CD8 T cells are more what we call cytotoxic T cells. These are the T cells that are like the hitmen of the, of the immune system. But there's also these T reg cells, regulatory T cells, and their job is to prevent us from having an immune reaction to our own cells. So T regs are important in preventing us from having autoimmune diseases. Macrophages are involved and myeloid derived suppressor cells and dendritic cells, they have the job of capturing these antigens like the vaccine that you got and presenting it to the immune system so that it can be educated. Um, you need to educate the whole immune system to be able to recognize the bad things and ignore the good things. Um, and with cancer, um, each of these cell types can have positive and negative effects for preventing that cancer from going on. So anti-tumorigenic effects are all listed here in white and in this green, gray, um, beige color, you can see that the immune system can have an impact that is negative, that helps the cancer. So immunotherapy for cancer is a, a new revolution and we're really excited about this. And so one of the discoveries we made is that T cells that have this molecule PD-1 on their surface, they have that molecule for an important reason. They have that molecule so that in certain contexts, other members of the immune system can tell the T cell that it's okay. This is not something to recognize. You can um, become senescent. Your recognition is not important. Unfortunately, what some cancers have learned to do is to mimic that. And so some cancers have learned that if they express, and by learn, I think they do this by accident. So they kind of accidentally express the wrong molecule, this PDL1 molecule. And when they do, they survive better. So then those cells get the advantage and they outgrow their neighboring cancer cells because they've got this new advantage. And the reason they have this new advantage is they're telling the T cell, hey, nothing to see here, everything's okay, you can, you can become quiescent. But we, once we discovered that cancer cells do this sometimes, we develop drugs that are this green target here that interact in between and prevent the cancer cell from telling the T cell what to do. So this is a good card carrying example of a new innovation in therapy for cancer. And in 2015, Jimmy Carter, who had had melanoma, um, you know, I think he spent a lot of time in the sun working on Habitat for Humanity houses, and he's a fair skinned individual. So he wound up with a skin cancer called melanoma. It metastasized to his brain but he was treated with this drug and it cured him. He has had a long-term cure, um, even at his old age of his 
metastatic malignant melanoma. Unfortunately, this is kind of only good for some people. So if we took all people with cancer and looked for how often these PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitors work, it's really only about 2% of the time, 2% of cancers that are using this mechanism. So we've been looking at the complexity of this immune system and asking, are there other interactions at work and are there other drugs we can develop? And just to, uh, again, scare you a little bit about the complexity, these are just a handful uh, really of all the interactions that we're studying. And excitingly, everywhere in red that you see um, a red line or a red arrow or red words here, all of those are drugs that are either in use today or in clinical trials today to see if we can increase our ability and increase that 2% number dramatically. So at the, at the same time, we, we would like to know, just like we did with the mutations, who is gonna to respond to which of the drugs? And so in order to do that, we at the NCI and in a group that Laura and I work with to study the um, characterization of screen detected lesions, including breast cancers detected by mammographic screening, we recognize that we ought to be able to have a method for scoring the immune microenvironment. And we spent a lot of time working on this. Just to show you some of the pretty color pictures, this is the system and the system gives us um, all these colors and all this detailed analysis. But at the end of it, what we know is all of the immune cells, where they are, how close to the cancer they are, and what does this mean becomes the next question. So here's just two examples. I told you that FOXP3 T cells are regulating or suppressing the immune um, reaction to a tumor, whereas CD8 cells are actively trying to attack the tumor. And so in this case, just two examples, I have a low number compared to a higher number of these T regulatory cells. And when I have this higher number, you can see that I have almost no uh, cytotoxic attacking T cells. And so just characterizing these two tumors, I can say with some certainty, the T cells are more active against the tumor here. And this is a tumor where um, we would expect a better prognosis because the immune system is doing a good job attacking it. Down here, the FOXP3 cells are telling the CD8 cells that they can go away and there's none of them there or very few of them. And so I would say this is a tumor that is not being attacked very well by the immune system. So of course it's more complicated than that. And that's part of my theme today is that nature is very complicated. So here's what happens if we start looking at the complicated um, interactions and, and Nikki Snyder showed you this in her lightning talk today a little bit, but we can characterize using all these different colors in our microscopy, which immune cells are there. And then we can catalog individual patients across the top. And you can see different grades. We talked about DCIS grade here. We can look at whether or not they make HER2, whether or not they make estrogen receptor. And then at the bottom, we can begin to look at the complexity of all these interactions with T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the CD68 is marking the macrophages, PDL1 we're looking for. Um, and you can see there are, for different patients, different groups. Here's a group that has a lot of CD8 T cells that, that are ostensibly attacking. But even within that group, there are some that have a lot of PDL1 and PDL1 um, interactions. They might be good candidates for anti PDL1 therapies. And some have very little PDL1. Over here, you see a group of, of DCIS lesions that have almost no inflammatory reaction. They're very immuno, immunologically quiet. Here, we may have to figure out how to teach the immune system to begin to recognize those DCIS cells. And in the middle, we have an example where there's very little immune reaction, and it turns out that the DCIS cells themselves are expressing that PDL1, just like um, we think the melanoma cells for Jimmy Carter, we're expressing PDL1. Here, these DCIS cells are expressing PDL1. And we ought to be able to dramatically increase that immune reaction if we treat with one of those 
PDL1 inhibitors. Um, looking at the proximity, so where these cells are, where are those Treg cells and are they next to the T cells and interacting with them? That just takes our same plot and it makes it even more complicated because now instead of just looking at where the, whether the cells are there or not, or how many are there, we're now looking at how many are interacting with one another. And so again, this very rapidly becomes a complicated problem. But at the end of the day, we wanna use this to identify those different groups that I was putting boxes around and reclassify DCIS as some that the immune system is taking care of very well, some that the immune system can be helped and can be assisted with some of our new drugs to attack and some where the immune system is not playing a role. And we need to figure out how to in, encourage the immune system, how to vaccinate for that DCIS and encourage the immune system to take a more active role. So uh, this is all about teamwork. You've seen a team of us today on the panel and it's a much bigger team behind the scenes. Um, I like to say that just when you think you've got it all figured out, mother nature turns out to be far more complicated than you ever realize. And um, many of you know the blind man and the elephant, um, famous Hindu parable. Um, we really need all of our doctors to be working together to describe the elephant and learn how to treat it better. And these are some of the, the blind men that I work with um, and enjoy it very much. Uh, always trying to push things forward for better outcomes for patients with breast cancer. So thank you very much. And uh, I think you've all stuck with us a long time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. And we've uh, actually extended our time quite a bit. So we'll let everybody go, but we'll keep your questions and we'll actually post them. Ananya will help us put the recording up there and we'll answer some of these questions offline and uh, put some answers up and it'll actually help us figure out how to build our little videos to explain things better. I wanna thank everybody today for all their hard work, especially Melinda Walker and Rashna Sunavala, the whole tech team who supported us. And of course, I also have to thank Michael Endicott, my husband for getting the whole setup in the kitchen for me so I could zip in there and get garlic and cheese and deliciousness all over my hands. Uh, <clears throat> don't forget you can use lemon, mayonnaise, uh, and you know, just some good soap and water too to get that garlic and, and uh, red pepper off your hands. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed your time this morning with Taste for the Cure. It was really fun. Next year, let's certainly hope we can do it in person. It was a wonderful morning. Thanks so much for spending it with us. We will send out um, a link to the uh, to the to the uh, recording and uh, questions that we didn't get to answer. We'll uh, put those up. And uh, I hope you enjoyed your Zumba last week and your cooking this week and all the new information that you've learned. We've certainly enjoyed our morning with you. So thanks again. And uh, thanks to everyone, all the interns, to Sandy, to Jennifer for giving us education, to Laura Vanfair for her great moderating of the questions. So until next year, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Taste for the Cure and a Taste for Science signing off. Thanks again. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs>